It is during worship that some like to have a lot of talk and little action. It is also today being distracted by those things that can happen in the service. We must be attentive to God's voice. Listen, I want to hear God speak to me today, don't you? I want, I want God to teach me today. Because there's always something, regardless of how many times maybe you have read Ecclesiastes chapter number 5, verses 1 through 7, where we're at this morning. Regardless of how many times you have set through a lesson or set through a sermon, the Bible is the only book that from the very same verses can give us something brand new. You know why that's true? It's because God himself is the author of it, amen? And God wants to teach us. And God can do that when we become attentive to his word. Secondly, we must be reverent. We must be reverent. We must remember who God is. Who God is. Solomon writes this. He says, Be not rash with thy mouth. Have you ever known somebody who just talks too much? You better say amen or we're going to park. It's called <laughs> the rash of the mouth, amen? That's what it is. That's my translation. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon the earth, therefore let thy words be few. Listen, there are some people who are very graceful with their words, and there are some people who are not. There are some people today uh, that can be very good in meeting and greeting people with, a, with few words that mean a whole lot, and there are others that can just like, like a machine gun going off. Amen? Okay, let me ask again. You say amen there, you know I'm right. Being reverent requires us to let God speak to us and not be so hasty to be talking over top of Him. We worship God who has redeemed us because, because we need to be attentive, because we need to reverence Him, and thirdly, we do it because we can focus on Him. Man, how many times do I pray this prayer? God, let us focus upon you for the next few moments. Because listen, there can be a lot of things that can drag our attention the wrong way. Have you ever sat through a service and it's getting a tad long and the preacher's winding the thing up and we're thinking about, do I have a seat at the restaurant? You're not going to admit that, but you know I'm right. Because I've thought the same thing before, amen? Listen, God's business is far more important than getting my seat at the restaurant. Amen? Here's one big reason why. We are doing eternal business with the God of heaven in any given service. And I can skip a meal and still be okay. You can say amen there. It's because of the cookies class. That's what did it to me. I mean, in one week, I've gained an unreal amount of weight because people kept forcing me to eat those cookies at gunpoint. But we must focus on what God has for us. I'll set through the service in a few moments and Pastor Joe comes to preach. And we'll get toward the end of the service and we'll give what we call an invitation. You're very familiar with it. Can I just tell you today, I don't think there's any more important time in a worship service than when we invite people to do business with God. And doggone it, if I've got to wait on some food a little bit later, so be it. Because we're doing eternal business, and the best meal you're going to have today is going to be temporary, because you're going to be hungry again tonight. Amen? Amen? That's right. Be focused upon what God is doing. Solomon writes, for a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's, listen to this, I'm just going to read the verse, make no comment, I believe, that God, I believe that God's word is very plain, but the Bible says this in verse 3, 
and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. The word dream there probably refers to daydreaming or mental drifting away. And that can happen in any service. We all have things going on in our lives. I understand that. But we should be able to just simply focus on what God has for me today because this is His day. This is His Word. We're in His house. We're with His people. And He wants to speak to us through His Word. But we've got to stay focused. We've got to reverence who God is. And we've got to be attentive to what God is trying to teach us. There's a great verse I found in the book of Psalms, chapter 46, and verse number 10, where the psalmist says this, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. This means that we lock in on what God has for us. It's amazing today, and I'm no different than you, but it does speak to my heart, and God does convict me of this. It's amazing today what people will remember out of a particular service. Can I challenge you today, and I challenge my life as well, and and just so you know, I teach and I preach to myself the same that you get on Sunday morning, okay? So I've, I've went through these points and what I've learned from God's Word this week, and I've preached to myself. I don't do it in the mirror, but, but I consider it myself before I give it to you. Um, there are things that sometimes can, uh, can distract us in any, in any given worship service. And I try to, my best to lock in on the Word of God when it is being taught and when it's being preached. I know many times that it happens. I do my best uh, to try to do that. Uh, I'm not perfect at it, but I try to, to look through a, a, a scope, so to speak, on what the Word of God is trying to teach me. Fourthly, don't delay your commitments to God. Don't delay your commitments to God. Solomon puts it like this. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed, in verse number four. The key word is defer. Listen, if you make a commitment to God, or if you make a vow to God, the very same, and you defer, or you delay, or you wait down the road to, 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 to own up to that, you are disobeying God. The truth is this. When we become Christians, when we accept Christ not only as Savior, but as Lord, it means He becomes our Master. He becomes our boss. In the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to, and I, and I learned this this week. It was a learning point for me. I hope it is for you. Uh, in the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to as Savior only twice. Think about this. Book of Acts, the book of action, the church at work. In the book of Acts, Jesus is referred to as Savior only twice. Chapter 5, verse 31, and chapter 13, verses 23. However, he is called Lord over 90 times. What does that teach me today? He needs to be more than my Savior, which I, I thank God that he is. And I thank God that I'm saved for all of eternity. Aren't you? I'm glad he's my Savior. But he also needs to be my Lord. And that's why over 90 times the Word of God in the one book of Acts calls him Lord. In the entire New Testament, Jesus is called Savior about 20 times. Now, if once it's in the Word of God, that's plenty. I understand that, right, class? I mean, if God's Word says it once, that's enough. But you can't help but do the numbers and consider what the Bible is trying to teach us here. In the New Testament, He is called Savior about 20 times, but He is called Lord over 400 times. Listen, that's not just an accident. 
That's not just something that God thought would be good to put in his word. It is in there for a reason. He should be my Savior. He should be my Lord. If Jesus is truly the Lord of our lives, we can say with the psalmist in Psalm 116 and verse 18, I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Listen, if you promise God something, you know what you need to do? You need to come through, amen? Right, class? You make a vow to God, you need to own up to it and do it. God honors his word, and God honors his promises, right? As followers of God today, we need to honor ours as well. Live up to the commitments to get the most out of worship. You've got to do the right things before worship. You've got to do the right things during worship. And lastly, you've got to do some things after worship. What happens when it's over? What happens when we leave here in a little bit? What happens then? Well, in verses 5 through verses number 7, uh, let's read those. Better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. In other words, if you're going to talk it, you're going to walk it, right? If you're going to talk about these things you committed to God, you need to come through. You need to do it. Verse 6. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also uh, diverse vanities, but fear thou God. We must keep our commitments. God's word teaches us here in verse number 5, it's better not to make a vow, it's better to not make a promise than to make it and not come through. By the way, aren't you glad our God comes through in his word and what God promises he always comes through on? I mean, I'm glad we serve a God today of promise. And I glad we serve a God who's promised us that he cannot lie and he comes through. Sometimes vows or promises are made to the Lord in an attempt to manipulate him and make serious problems go away. How many times have God's people been at the bottom of the barrel, buried in problems, and we say something like this, God, if you can get me out of this mess, I'll never get back in. You ever, you ever prayed that? God, I have shipwrecked this thing. I've made a mess of it, and God, if you can get me out of it, and you can help me, I'll take steps to never be back here. And God honors his word, and you need to honor yours as well, amen? If you vow it, be a person of character, be a person of integrity, be a person of honesty, and just do what you said you promised to God. Unfulfilled vows to God are not good for us. Some might think, well, the best thing is to not make any kind of commitment to God. The best thing then, George, is for me is to make, to make no vow to God. Listen, that's not what we're after. Listen, please remember this from this Sunday school hour. If we never make any new commitments to the Lord, we will stop growing spiritually. Think about that. If you never make any new commitments to God, if you never take on any new challenges, if you never try to do what you believe God's will is for your life, you are going to stop growing spiritually. And that's what happens when we choose to do nothing for God, take on nothing new, when we quit serving God, no commitments to God. I promise you, if that's, if that's your mindset, you are going to stop growing spiritually. If you do not regularly make new commitments and new vows to God, your spiritual life becomes stagnant. It becomes stuck in zero. I don't know about you today, but I do not want to be a spiritual zero. I want to have some value in God's work, don't you? I don't want to feel like in my Christian journey uh, that I just reached a place where there's nothing else. Listen, class, there is so much more for us 
So many areas for us that we can grow in. So many areas for us that God wants to use us. But if you just decide to kick it back and go into neutral, I promise you, your spiritual life is going to suffer. You're going to find yourself being stagnant, doing nothing for God, and not enjoying the worship of God. Listen, I tell people quite often, even though Sundays can be exhausting, I love God's day, don't you? I mean, this is my people right here, amen? This is your people. I mean, this ought to be uh, the best part of our week to come to God's house with God's people, with God's word, and let God feed us and grow us. But it's up to us, class. Uh, you, you can choose to turn it on, or you can choose to turn it off. After worship, we take what God teaches us, and we take it to our world. I say it quite often like this, man, it's easy to come to a Sunday school class like this. It's easy to come to a worship service and sit in nice padded pews and air-conditioned auditorium and, and nice audio and nice video and, and, uh, and good teaching and good preaching from God's Word. That's all good. And man, it feeds us and it grows us inside these walls. But here's the challenge for all of us. We can't just keep it here. We need to take it to our world. Agreed, class? We need to take it to our world. You know what was an awesome thing for me? And I know I've talked about uh, the cookie a lot this morning, and, and that's okay because God used it. It was awesome for me to, uh, to be at the fair this week and to see God's people mingling in the crowd out there, inviting people to church and telling people about Jesus Christ. You know what that is? That's taking our commitment to God outside these walls to our world. You know why that's so important this morning? Because as, as I look around this Sunday school class, probably every single person in this Sunday school class today would, get, would give testimony that they've been born again. They're redeemed and on their way to heaven. And I thank God for that. I thank God for that. But as I, as I looked around our fair week, I want to tell you, I saw multitudes of people that I know by their own testimony don't know God. He's not Savior, and He's not Lord. And that's why it encourages my heart. And you know what else it does for me? It builds my faith. It grows me. You know what happens when someone gets saved at these altars, or someone comes to be baptized? You know what it does for me? It charges my battery. Does it not charge yours? Man, God's at work. It's spiritually uplifting. It's refreshing. But it, it has to happen when we take the message outside of this place, to the highways and the, and the community that we live in. Keep our commitments. Take God seriously all week. Solomon writes, in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities. This means there must be a lasting, realistic response to what God's will in, in our life is. It means that we take on the purpose that God has for us, and I believe that God reveals his will to us. And I believe God today wants to grow us and wants to use us. There's much more we could say today, but our time is nearly gone. I hope you glean from this Sunday school hour today. I hope you understand that if we're going to get the most out of worship, it requires us to be ready when we come, pay attention when you get here, and take what you learn to our world. Amen? Hey, listen, I'm glad God sent someone in my life that came after me. Amen? Aren't you glad God sent someone in your life to come after you? I'm sure you are. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you for this time of Sunday school. God, I thank you for your written word this morning. I thank you for what you have taught us thus far in our study of Ecclesiastes. Lord, I do pray today for the worship hour that will begin in a few moments. God, I pray today that people will, will come prepared to worship the God of heaven. Lord, I pray that they will come and that they will pay attention during your preaching and the singing of your word. And Lord, then when they leave here, I pray that they will take what they've learned. They will take what you've taught them. They will take the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, to a people in our neighborhood, 
to somewhere in Connorsville or surrounding communities or counties. God, that your people today will take what you've given them from your word today to bless someone else's life. Lord, I do, pr- I do pray for Pastor Joe this, for, the, for the message that he has this morning. God, I pray that what he has to say today would be from the throne of God this morning. And God, I do pray today that as people come to worship, that we'll see you, you, you at work this morning, that someone will be saved, decisions will be made, and we'll thank you and praise you for it all. We ask and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being in our Sunday school hour. We will begin our main worship service in about 15 minutes.